ICAP and Sankalp. I welcome you all to day two of the 13th Sankalp Global Summit. Thank you so much for joining us for this session presented to you in partnership with GINSEP. Uh, before we begin, two quick points. To start with, please introduce yourself and your organization in the chat box. And the second, uh, keep your mic switched off during the discussion, but feel free to engage in the chat box with whatever comments, questions that you might have. With that, again, a very, very warm welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us today. I hand over and welcome Ambassador Gurjeet Singh to proceed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Trina, and a very good morning to people in Germany. Good afternoon to people in India. I'm very happy that we have this session today. About five years ago, when we first had a meeting of startups between India and Germany in Berlin, I never thought we would go so far that they would be a GINSEP and GINSEP would be engaging at Sankal. So I really admire this journey, which we started then and is today coming through. I am uh, very happy to have a very good panel who you will hear now. Let me give you a little context about India and Germany. Germany is India's most important economic partner in the European Union. Our trade is pretty big, our investments are big, and uh, the important thing is that the investment from Germany to India and India to Germany are round about equal. There's not a big disparity of only a one way coming through a lot of Indian investment in Germany too. So it is that spirit of partnership that I really wish to build on. The second aspect is that the formal relationship between India and Germany at the level of the government is very heavily looking at achievement of SDGs. You know, uh, the German um, ODA to India is looking at renewable energy, looking at the Namami Gange project. This looks at, uh, uh, you know, um, of the solar rooftop project, uh, transportation, which is not uh, polluting, and many such things. So it is essentially greening its way to a better world, providing impact to governmental action. So German startups and German technology are also very well known. And as from the side of Sankal, we bring forward people whose other attributes being what they are, their hearts are in the right places because they want to make the correct impact, socio-economic impact. And when we say heart is in the right place or impact, what we mean is that we try and contribute to develop the SDGs and implement. It is not possible to implement every SDG through technology. Yesterday, those of you who were fortunate to hear the keynote addressed by Nobel Peace Laureate Kailar Satyarthi, who spoke about child rights, will understand that there are certain limitations which can be overcome only by a search for impact rather than a search for technology. But both have to go hand in hand. So today, we are trying to bring together the amazing startup movement and the technology movement of Germany and the rather smart impact investment movement in India in the hope that we will create a technology for good paradigm and develop it further. With those few words, I would now like to have the keynote addressed by the Honorable Mr. Dirk Wiese, a member of the German Bundestag, re-elected recently, and the chairman of the German-India Parliamentary Friendship Association. Tina, may we have the video, please. Ladies and gentlemen, supporters from GINSEP, the German-Indian Startup Exchange Program, um, let me say at the beginning, that's an honor for me to have the possibility to say a few words, uh, to, have the, to give you a keynote uh, today at the GINSEP round table at uh, Sankal Global Summit. It's an honor for me to have this possibility. Um, it would be better if we had if we had a live statement, but actually we have uh, some negotiations as Social Democratic Party in Germany to form a new coalition government together with the Liberals and the Greens. 
So for that reason, I give you a video statement today, but for sure, uh, it's great that I have the possibility to do this. It's also very good that my friend Ambassador Gurjit Singh uh, is also here today. It's uh, good to see you, Gurjit. So hello from, from Germany. And it's good to see, of course, Julian Think. He's a project lead of the GINSEP program and he's an uh, important player for the German-Indian uh, relationship, of course. For me, as the chairman of the German-Indian Parliamentary Friendship Group, I'm very interested in deepening the partnership between India and Germany, especially in the economic sector. And I can assure you that all members of the German Indo Parliamentary Friendship Group are strong believers in strong German in a strong German Indian relationship. And also my predecessor, who was the chairman of the German Indian Parliamentary Friendship Group from 2013 to 2017, my colleague Mr. Ralph Brinkhaus. I followed him as a chairman and we are all big believers in the potential of our bilateral relationship. My relation to India is very special. In uh, 2010, I had the possibility to visit India for the first time. I um, had the possibility to do my legal clerkship in the German embassy in New Delhi. That was great because um, it was very hot, it was in summer and it was great to, to see a lot of great landscapes, great cities, great people all over the whole country, from Amritsar to Trivanandrum, from Chennai to Rishikesh, of course. And uh, since 2010, I'm engaged in German-Indian relationship and, and I intensified these relationships, of course, with India as a member of German Bundestag. So the German-Indian Parliamentary Friendship Group was the first group I had chosen in 2013 to engage as a member of Parliament. India, I think you know, is strong standing in the world since the post-war years. India signed the 1947 General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. India was a founder member of the new WTO organization. India has an increasing incomes and a growing middle class that support and shows how important is India with a strong standing in the world's economy and that shows also that there is a good relationship for our bilateral economic relationships from Germany to India of course. We had also some very good programs in the past and actually as what we called Make in India Mittelstand, I think a program that Ambassador Singh knows very well. But we have a lot of things that we can also do more in our economic relationship in the upcoming future of course. India show, in my point of view, an almost unlimited growth potential. It is interesting for the international market and India has a big international standing that is India hardly worked on in many international organizations. And that is very important that we both have the belief to strengthen also the international relationships and international organization, organizations, of course. India is the biggest democracy in the world, two years older than our democracy in Germany. I always have to tell this to my colleagues in German parliament. It is for us one of the most important partners for us, but also for the European Union at all. And the rise of India is in interest, is in interest of Germany and the European Union. The basis of our partnership to Germany and to the European Union are the democratic values both our countries are built on and similar political interests with regard to peace and of course safety in the Indo-Pacific region. And also the view on the Indo-Pacific region is really important. I had the possibility to get um, to get a feeling of the talks that you are facing in the in the region as I was a member of the Ricina dialogue at the beginning of 2020, it was before Corona times, where I had a big discussion about the um, the situation in the Indian Ocean and um, the challenges that you were facing and other countries in the regions. For us, and I think also for you, it is important to have stability in the Indo-Pacific, to strengthen our multilateral interests, that we are, have also common multilateral interests, and promising and future oriented market for both sides. And for that, we need stability also in the region. And that is very important. Germany and Europe, I can assure you, want to reinforce the partnership. We laid down in our new policy guidelines from 2020 for the Indo-Pacific by the German government. Gurdjieff, we were in a, a exchange about this via WhatsApp. India is uh, most 
is the most important partner for these goals. Um, it is a key pillar for Germany's engagement also in the region. And um, the most important point that we are facing in the upcoming weeks and months, of course, is on the one hand security issues about the Indo-Pacific, but also one important point where we had ongoing talks since the beginning of this decade, of course, the potential of a free trade agreement with India and the European Union. I can assure you I'm a strong believer that we need such an, a free trade agreement that has a great potential and a big potential for both our side and this would be a big pillar for a stronger cooperation and also a stronger economic cooperation, of course, in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, we also have but also some challenges, challenges to cope with in our relationship. We also see that success today is linked with good communication and information technology. We also see that the cooperation in digital economy has an enormous potential for Europe and India. It uh, is one of the biggest challenges to create an attractive market in advancing digitalization. And I know since a long time that India has such a great potential for startup. These, these, these great startup ecosystem in India, it's, it's fantastic. So there's so much potential that we see for our bilateral relationships. And uh, I say some words also to Ginsep because Ginsep is a bridge between, between our two countries to strengthen also this potential in the upcoming weeks and months. Indian can become one of the important partners in digital policy. But what we need, of course, both Germany and India, Europe and India is uh, we need a free, open and safe cyberspace, of course. And one big issue for both our countries and in my new position also in Parliament as the Deputy Chairman of the Social Democratic Fraction in German Parliament um, is, of course, we have to fight cyber criminality. That is a big rising problem all over the world. It's a big rising problem for enterprises and we have to handle these together. No country can do this alone. So that is very important also if we take a look on the challenges in digital policy, of course. Of course, also in the last 18 months, the economic and social consequences of the corona pandemic are still changing. Of course, it is very good that we have the possibility uh, to do our meetings with uh, Microsoft Teams, with Zoom, with Webex. Do I miss something? I don't know. Yeah, but better is we have also the possibility to meet again in reality, to have talks in reality together. Also, some meetings are very good if we have them as online meetings, of course. That makes a lot of things possible, but it's also that we see um, us in reality. So for that reason, the next time I hope I can be with you uh, in reality if I don't have some things to do in Berlin with the new coalition government. So to come to an end, in this context, what I've said before, GINSEP is really welcome. We need these young creative people from Germany in India to cope with the challenges I said and to help to maintain the partnership and to develop it. As a parliamentary state secretary in uh, 2017 at the, the Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy, I had the possibility to initiate the project GINSEP. It started at a joint event in May 2017 and in February 2018 I had the possibility um, to come to India with the de GINSEP delegation and we launched the GINSEP program in New Delhi with also some meetings before in Bangalore and in Mumbai. But this was a great evening in New Delhi where also Liz Moan from the Battlesman Foundation um, participated where we launched this important initiative for our two countries. It's a bridge builder between Germany and Indian startup ecosystem and it had such a big potential for our economic relationship in the upcoming weeks and months. That's why I'm happy to see that the project still brings startups from India and Germany together and the initiative is, to sum up, a big success. In my position, I personally could talk to German and Indian young founders, of course. I really see a big interest in exchanges that, should, that, showed, that showed some challenges, of course, but especially always we see the big potential. And now we must not only talk about potential, we must do 
business between startup of our two countries. That's important. So it's glad that you glad to see that you decided to, to take part in GINSAP. Uh, you ensure its ongoing success for the future. So at the end, I hope you have a good and profitable exchange today. Thank you very much again for the possibility to say a short keynote at the beginning. The challenges are on the table, the potential is there, so we all can do together a lot to strengthen our bilateral relationships between Germany and India. And again, GINSAP is a key factor for this. It is a bridge builder between Germany and Indian startup ecosystem. So thanks again for, and to everybody who is engaged in this program. And again, thank you very much. Goodbye. And now we go back to our talks to form a new coalition government. Goodbye. Thank you. I think we were very fortunate to catch Mr. Wiese in between the negotiation for a new government in coalition in Germany. I think he said three very important things. First, he was himself involved in the early part of Jinsen. So he seems to be having a bright future. So I think uh, having a person who knows Jinsep well in government would be a great asset. Here. Secondly, he mentioned the creative youth. I think that is important. That is what we are looking at, the creativity of youth. And the third thing he mentioned, which was important, was the Indo-Pacific guidelines of the German government. So essentially, those are looking at the Indo-Pacific to enhance Germany's economic engagement with India and the ASEAN. So I think there we have great scope to increase the agenda that we are today setting up. With those few words, I have great pleasure in inviting Mr. Julian Zeeks, who is the lead of GINSEP, and with whom I had the good fortune of discussing this program before we launched it. So I am very happy to invite you, Julian, to please talk to us now. Thank you very much, Mr. Singh. Um, and uh, also, I'm really grateful that uh, uh, Mr. Dagwiese also did that keynote and that we have the government support um, from the German side. Um, and I also feel very grateful that I was actually able to 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 take, let's say, this this official initiative of GINSEP into into practice since a good three years now um, from Germany. Um, and um, yeah, so now we're here today. Um, I'm really happy also that we have the support of all the startups here that are there from India and Germany, but also last but not least, the, the audience that have joined today to talk about um, uh, this, important, uh, this important topic. Um, first, um, we heard a lot about GINSEP, so maybe I'll give you just an, uh, just an idea what GINSEP is also about. And also, most importantly, how you can uh, get involved um, and, um, and also benefit from it. So the idea we heard it from Mr. Wiesel already was uh, three years back, almost four years back now, um, an initiative from the German side to strengthen the economic ties in the fields of startup between Germany and India. But of course, as we know, particularly in the context of the Sankarp Summit, Today, this is uh, goes beyond the borders of, of Germany and India, but our focus is, of course, the teams from Germany and India, the founders, the startups, the activities that really inceptualize, that come out of Germany and India, uh, of their own countries, but also from cooperation between the countries, and then take them um, beyond um, these countries as well. So um, GINSEP works uh, as such that we're actually an open platform for, for uh, startups, of course, in the first place, but also other, all the other players that are active in the Indo-German startup ecosystem or want to be part of it. So um, that is, of course, beyond the, uh, besides the Indian and German startups, we work with many corporates from both India and Germany. We work with investors. We've recently launched an Indo-German uh, investor circle. Um, of course, many incubators and accelerators. These are different associations. Um, and other support organizations, but also a focus on uh, on talent as well, which is one of uh, one very very important factor. We mentioned it, uh, we heard it before that the youth, the the the, um, the talent, particularly from India, that is there will play or is playing now already in a major role um, on uh, with regard to global innovation and also particularly for for Germany. So this is one of the key drivers as well. 
in this entire um, in this entire context. Um, we work inbound and outbound, and that to uh, in Italy is the same both directions. And so from India to Germany and from Germany to India. Um, as this open platform, so startups reach out or get involved in our our project um, or in our activities, our events, and uh, we support them by providing access to networks, access to the market in the respective other country. But uh, uh, as I said, it should not stop at the borders of that other country, but should, of course, also go beyond that. Um, so besides the market, I mentioned the importance of talent. But then also capital is also one thing that we don't personally bring in, but we provide access to um, to VCs as well, which is, of course, needless to say, um, uh, relevant for the startups as well. So um, besides promotion, promoting different uh, opportunities that are there in the other market, we do also um, matchmaking activities and organize events, so capacity building different webinars, part of uh, exhibitions, uh, pitch events, uh, digital delegation uh, tours now during the pandemic. Now, uh, actually, there's a call for application uh, open for Indian startups going to Germany uh, in the uh, related to COVID and also tech for good. So any Indian startup out there that wants to have a look at, um, at, at Germany, please visit ginsep.co. There's a call for application for the upcoming digital delegation tour is open. And this is uh, free of charge for you. Um, a really great um, a way of, of exploring Germany. Over the last three years, we, of course, also identified um, the challenges or we heard about the challenges um, from the startups that are looking at the other market. And this is exactly our job and our duty from the GINSEP side to overcome this or to facilitate there to make sure we can provide a softer landing through our, our partner network. Um, in general, the issue is to understand, um, to get some orientation, to understand the market um, of, the, of the respective other, other country. So um, that initially among founders, it's very difficult to identify why do I really want to go there and where to go, right? So of course, India, sounds for the German startup, well, attractive big market, um, but um, this it, it, one, one needs to identify, well, better reasons and more specific reasons also why and where particularly to go within that region. And the same applies to Germany as well. Um, people might know about uh, Berlin and, and Munich as, as startup hubs, but it's very important to look beyond these um, these big um, hubs and uh, get a clear and better understanding of of the local startup ecosystem and also potential uh, well where the potential clients and so forth are located. Of course, it always depends on the product or the service, whatever is is being sold at the end of the day. Um, we've learned that actually partnership is the right way to overcome um, these challenges by finding the right partner. Of course, is also the challenge. But with a collaboration um, to overcome intercultural barriers, also these cultural challenges, starting, of course, from language, but also sales is done differently in other markets. Um, building trust, one has to start as a foreigner, as a stranger in another country. Um, also, uh, uh, negotiations of certain, um, of certain things. Um, that is simply done, business is simply done differently all over the world. So this is something where we always say, like we see most fruitful and most impactful are collaborations between the countries or between the um, companies in that matter. So startup, startup, but also corporate startup engagements, um, of course, as well. Then last but not least, of course, the network um, that is important to be built in the respective other country. And it starts from events like today, where you can connect to other people, where you can connect and reach out to other startups, to other players that can help you um, out to, to, um, to overcome these challenges. Um, I'll stop here now just by saying a few things about what is really in it for you. So I would really like to welcome um, other startups out there that are interested in, well, German startups that want to look at, at India. For some reason, I said it could be market, it could be potential partnerships of developing products together, so co-creation, but of course also Indian startups there that are looking at Germany or maybe tying up with a German uh, organization, startup, corporate, research institute, you name it. Um, but also, of course, corporates that are out there or investors that are out there or other organizations, we 
are there to bring all the organizations together that want to be part of the Indo-German startup ecosystem in order to facilitate, in order to provide access for startups to these organizations and so forth. And um, this um, we're doing really successfully in some, now since three to four years. Um, and we have uh, more than 170 different partners uh, now in our network from Germany and India. We have a, a GINSIP ambassador network um, with experts that are also there to, to as a first point of contact for the startups. So in that way, we are um, trying to help out or actually helping out startups on the way to the other market for, and this is very important for whatever reason, because as I said, and this is why we're also part of uh, Sankap today, it goes beyond Germany and India, but uh, German Indian cooperation um, seems to be really, really uh, uh, fruitful and um, um, with high potential and impactful when it comes to also global impact, particularly when it comes to the impact field. So SDGs, we see lots of uh, startup activity happening on particularly that field. And I think with um, German uh, innovation and research and German ideas, and of course also uh, Indian, the startup mindset, really creative and innovative ideas are coming uh, from from Thank India, you. I see really really great potential in. Thank this, you very um, much, Julian. Okay, now Think over so. over to you. Back to Mr. Singh. Thank ben. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. So I think now we have a very good idea of what Ginsep can do for us, and I think this should be the start of a Ginsep Sankalp partnership. I am very happy that at this panel discussion today we have seven very interesting and eminent innovators. And without further ado, I'm going to now ask them to please tell us about themselves, their work, the impact they create, and if there is an Indo-German or other linkage that they could highlight. Five minutes each, please. Mr. Abhijit Banso, Founder and Creative Director, Studio ABD, Iguna. You have the floor, sir. Abhijit, please go. Yes. Um, thank you, Ambassador Singh. Uh, Sankal team for inviting me to Jinsep Roundtable. Uh, it is a great honor and opportunity to share our story. Greetings to the fantastic panel of speakers today. My name is Abhijit Bansod and I'm joining you from Bangalore, India. <clears throat> I'm a product designer by profession and after a decade long stint with Titan Design Studio, which is a watch and jewelry brand in India. I co-founded Studio ABD in 2008, a design studio to explore various facets of Indian design. That's something always intrigued me to find opportunity to define what Indian design should be. Just like Scandinavian design, just like Japanese design, what is our design philosophy and how do we find it relevance of that into a contemporary world? Uh, our focus has always been to find an elegant, sustainable design solution by fusing local cultural narratives, appropriate technology and storytelling design. A true reflection of our development and progressiveness is to see our streets as clean, neat and beautiful as our inside compound experiences. The tangible and intangible progress must reach the bottom of pyramid to bridge the social divide and to bring pride and a sense of belonging for everyone on street. One of the most critical players in India's middle-class consumer market is the humble street vendors and hawkers. They are the lowest denominator of a retail market, providing product and services to most inaccessible consumers uh, in our populous country. While fortunate people like us have progressed to the next level, with economic and technological revolution, one large section is still stuck with old outdated systems and, and the entire section is Indian street vendors. There are more than 10 million estimated street vendors in urban cities of India. Most of them use makeshift contraption on bicycles to adapt their businesses needs. Since independence, the design of this cycle for these vendors and their life has remained the same. The most mobile businesses also are designed 
happen to be designed like appears to be designed for men and women though participate equally in earning the wages there are very few examples on street that uh, the women entrepreneurs have their mobility uh, hence i think tiguna was born of a concept and tiguna is a state of art mobility solution that improves the quality of life and earning potential of every delivery associate and the street vendor tiguna in means three times in hindi and tiguna offers possibility of three times business mobility reach comfort safety which is very important very easy to use and for me the most important is pride to the street vendors tiguna provides an equal opportunity uh, for women vendors to have a safe and easy mobility for the first time tiguna trike is compatible with the regional and traditional costumes across india which is a very important factor because you need to be very sensitive to where they come from and how they really operate their daily life our vision is to disrupt the last mile retail experience with human centered design and a robust mobile platform our dream is to retail our trike at 100 dollars to achieve our million users goal tiguna movement could possibly impact more than 6 sdgs mainly focusing on gender equality and decent work and economic growth which is our priority right now um, in this pandemic era we would love to explore a collaboration with german partners in engineering and technology to create high quality low cost tech enabled product and systems to transform pt into pride for millions of lives across developing nations thank you and namaste thank you very much uh, mr bansod for being precisely on time and wonderful explanation of the name tiguna excellent i have great pleasure now in inviting the co-founder of plantix ms bianca kumar you have the floor for the next 5 minutes thank you mr singh great thanks to everyone uh, from berlin germany Uh, my name is Bianca Kuma and as said I'm one of the co-founders of Plantix a German Indo-based company and I'm personally in charge of our international cooperations. Um at Plantix we are focusing on changing the way smallholder farmers in India and around the globe receive good agricultural advice and get the right products and services at hand whenever they need them. Our agricultural app helps farmers worldwide for free and in 18 local languages by providing remote agricultural know-how. Um, the app supports farmers through various features such as crop cultivation guidance, a global community, um, or a fertilizer and pesticide uh, calculation based on the uh, field size. However, the core of the of the app is the automated image recognition for plant diseases, pests, and nutrient deficiencies. based on a single picture provided by the user and um based on this picture the app automatically detects more than 500 plant damages on more than 16 crops within seconds this automated design makes it possible to support millions of farmers around the world simultaneously and from the beginning on the goal of plantex was improving our global food security We all know that the demand for food is increasing but um especially the western world has really reached its limits when it comes to yield per um, per hectare um <clears throat> and the availability of arable land. So the Plantix app has always been developed for smallholder farmers in emerging or developing countries where the potential and the need um to increase yields is still incredibly high. Currently the app reaches about 1 million farmers every month and focuses on a social and environmental impact by creating a radical change in agriculture to to enrich farming livelihoods and feed the generations to come. Um based on recently conducted impact ass assessment we can say that over 70% uh, of our users had never access to a tool like Plantix before and over 80% confirmed that their quality of life has improved. since they are since they are using us that means for the first time in the farming life they are now able to obtain an accurate uh, diagnosis 
and uh, yeah, with this at hand uh, to act timely um, to to avoid crop losses, to increase their yields, and to appropriately apply pesticides and fertilizers. Um, on top of this, we are making sure that the farmer gets the most appropriate product um, at the local shop. And we we are able to do so because retailers and producers um, of agricultural inputs are part of our ecosystem too. Uh, we have more than 40 million crop images in our database. Therefore, we know exactly where diseases occur and which product is needed to, to manage them. In combination with our more than 30,000 partner retailers on the ground in India, we are sure that every Indian farmer not only knows the advisory on disease management, but also on how to, to apply the product and where to get it. So that means with Plantix, we are able to, to generate um, unprecedented data-driven insights into the entire value chain of agri-inputs, um, thus having meaningful impact for producers, retailers, and of course, most important, the farmer. That means normally farmers rely on agricultural extension systems maintained by the state governments or by non-governmental organizations. Um, this is super important. It's an individual support for millions of farmers, but of course it's also limited by the number of extension staff. That means inadequate support for farmers leads to, cross, uh, to crop losses, to lo lower yields, to poorer selling prices, particular due to crop uh, damages from pest diseases and nutrient deficiencies that are not recognized timely or treated in a timely and adequate manner. Another major impact is the excessive and incorrect use of agricultural input, uh, inputs, of course, which causes significant harm to the environment as well as to people. So to, to summarize the permanent access for farmers to adequate and detailed agricultural advice and the direct connection to retailers who have these inputs um, for the farmer is crucial for a global future uh, on many levels. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca. I can see that you are doing a very useful service and your own statistics that you quoted show us how useful your clients find your work. I think a very good initiative on Agritech. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thank I have now great pleasure in inviting the founder and CEO of Villa Mart Private Limited, Dr. Ramesh Chandra Biswal. You have five minutes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Gurshit Singh. So uh, yeah, myself, Dr. Ramesh Narviswal, and uh, I did actually, I did my PhD from my Padakpur, then I was working as a scientist in USA. And uh, basically I was born and brought up uh, in um, Hillis uh, in uh, uh, Odisha, that is in India. And I have, uh, I have experienced the problem of, of, of the farmers and rural consumers. And uh, so while I was working there in USA, I felt uh, my need if I can do something for my villagers, uh, for the farmers, because uh, now in the age of technology, uh, um, our, uh, we are unable to provide uh, technological support to the farmers. And uh, uh, our technology is uh, so vast, so uh, wide that we are unable to implement it, it in the rural India. And uh, our farmers, uh, they're, they're not uh, used to understand that, that kind of um, technology. So how to simplify this thing? Uh, so that's why I, say, uh, I uh, talked with my uh, some of my friends. So we discussed a model, and uh, and we thought of uh, solving this problem, and uh, that's how Vilamat started. And Vilamat is basically a village market. Uh, so yeah, we thought to provide the technologies to the farmers and rural consumers. So however, we put to that, can we uh, can you provide them a marketplace? And if if we're not providing a marketplace uh, for the uh, farmers and consumers, rural consumers, then uh, and the um, it's a point of technology is has no meaning. So that's why I mean, so I've started uh, from uh, from marketplace, and I've started with a mobile outlet model. Um, back in 2016, I left my job uh, in USA, and I came back to my village, and uh, I've started uh, on pilot basis. Uh, I mean, so on this means so a mobile outlet, uh, which is roaming in the villages. It sells the um, means vegetable and groceries to the villagers, and also it procures the farm produce directly from their home. 
so that way means uh, it was very means uh, efficient means we got uh, good uh, uh, means uh, precision for this and we got uh, um, means uh, we helped the farmers and because thing is uh, um, means uh, farmers are basically uh, depending on this middleman and they are uh, means, uh, depending on the cities uh, to sell their produce or even to get the consumable items for their households so after uh, means uh, uh, launching this model it was helpful and then to uh, means, uh, to make it sustainable we have implemented a static outlet model in the cities and uh, now we have two kinds of uh, outlet one is mobile another is static in case of mobile outlet it reaches to the consumers or the farmers and uh, they can sell their uh, produce directly to that mobile outlet or uh, they can uh, uh, purchase and in case of uh, static outlet model the farmers or uh, the consumers they can reach to this uh, to, to any of our static outlet so in this uh, case uh, it is a good means win win situation for uh, both the consumers as well as uh, farmers and we are we are uh, means implementing technology in terms of waste means uh, waste uh, wastage detection that is low cost cold storage or cold storage and even solar drying uh, technologies um, uh, in and rural areas and uh, in our case uh, the uh, cold storage or cold storage is solar operated uh, and uh, it is mini also it means in the village level in the block level we are trying to uh, build uh, this kind of cold storage so that uh, uh, we can uh, reduce the wastes and uh, we, are, we are implementing uh, solar uh, operated uh, multi weather uh, means uh, solar dryer so which can help the uh, farmers and uh, rural women to means add value to their products and uh, um, uh, to reduce the wastes also and even to enhance their income and uh, uh, and also in terms of sourcing sourcing the uh, vegetables but trying to implement ai based ai ml based uh, procurement system means how to uniform on this uh, sourcing part uh, because thing is uh, right now we are uh, means, uh, our, some of our experts they are going to uh, check the quality of the products and based on that we are uh, fixing the price but it is not uh, we can't uniform that way so we, we have to implement certain technologies to uh, to inform on uh, this kind of procurement system that's why we are working on this ai based uh, procurement module so that uh, this that that can be means uh, inform uh, means you can inform that model and uh, it can be expandable to different places yeah so uh, in terms of uh, and so collaboration with german means uh, 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 because the german is good in uh, this handy technologies and also in terms of uh, renewable energy and uh, since we are working in the village uh, uh, we are basically focusing on this handy technologies uh, means look on the cost effective technologies uh, i mean uh, whether uh, it is to means uh, to uh, check the quality of the uh, food products or uh, to uh, enhance the shelf life and in terms of renewable energy a uh, local local cost effective technologies uh, so we can uh, discuss in that part uh, so that uh, it, that will be helpful uh, and to uh, to our Indian farmers and uh, rural consumers. Thank you, Dr. Biswal. Very interesting that when you were studying overseas, you thought about your village, and then you came back and set up Villa Mart to reduce losses and improve the income and food quality of people. Most uh, interesting, and I really like the way that you have conceptualized it and what you have done. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you. I have great pleasure now in inviting Mr. Aditya Pitti founder and COO of KP. You have five minutes, sir. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Singh. You know, thank you, Sankalp Forum, Jinsep, and uh, also uh, my fellow panelists. So I'm Aditya Pitti, the co-founder and CEO of KP. I'm located in Pune, India. Uh, KP is an embedded fintech pay-as-you-go platform that enhances consumer affordability and accessibility and thereby helps drive financial inclusion. Our business model works by licensing our technology to manufacturers of electrical appliances and devices and, and hence enables them to seamlessly integrate creative forms of payment, credit, etc., into their products and use the pay-as-you-go model essentially to convert the upfront price barrier of a product into small and flexible payments. KPA's technology consists of a firmware and software component. The firmware is our proprietary algorithm or coding that is inputted by the manufacturer into the existing hardware of their product. And the software platform allows the device to function by way of codes uh, and run for a particular amount of time and also to receive data of usage patterns and behavior. 
we are really driven by our vision to develop Pago technologies that are usable, affordable, and accessible to all sections of society, thereby transforming lives. You know, the USPs of our technology is that it can work in an offline mode, as well as in an online mode with GSM, IoT, etc. We are also able to offer, uh, offer unique uh, business models such as pay per use. So that's essentially paying uh, as you're using the product, pay per time, and also a unique thing called pay per amp or ampere, where somebody is paying as per the energy being consumed. The software platform has AI-based data analytics and credit ratings and other value-added services, which are very flexible for individual requirements. We are also a technology that is hardware agnostic. So it can, you know, we have uh, numerous use cases, whether it is solar home system or other kind of applications. Uh, we are presently the only Pago technology uh, present uh, in India and uh, which is potentially the largest future market for Pago. Uh, we are also a very low cost Pago technology at nearly half the cost of our nearest competitor. This is primarily because of our innovative technology, our engineers being based in India, and also because we uh, are backed by an asset light business model. In terms of contributing to the SDG goals, you know, our technology acts more of a catalyst and enabler for various use case and applications that in turn contribute to the SDG goals. Uh, for example, you know, SDG seven about affordable and clean energy. So we are able to enable ownership and usage of solar home systems, which in turn add to SDG, SDG seven. Uh, SDG six, clean water and sanitation. We've implemented our use cases in water ATMs as well as smart toilets. Uh, SDG one, no poverty. Uh, you know, we are also enabling access and ownership of productive use appliances. Example, water pumps for irrigation, uh, farming equipment, sewing machine, food storage and refrigeration, et cetera. Uh, we believe that there is a huge potential for Indo-German collaboration uh, uh, here. Uh, you know, because we work with manufacturers, Germany is the hub for manufacturers and especially for electrical and electronic devices. So, you know, we could very easily work with them to provide uh, the Pago technology to them. Uh, uh, there are potentials to work with German energy companies. Uh, also, our uh, uh, Pago platform perform, uh, uh, supports product as a service business model. So, you know, these are uh, kind of service models more prevalent in the developed countries. You know, Philips has launched light as a service. Bosch has launched washing as a service. So we could very well catalyze such business models and work with German companies. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Ambassador Singh. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Pitti. I really like the way you had structured your short presentation, covering all the points in detail. Well done, really wonderful. Thank you. I am now very happy to invite Ms. Rebecca Slieger, the Public Relations Manager of Africa Green Tech. You have the floor, ma'am, for another five minutes. Yes, thank you so much. So, hello, good morning to Germany and good afternoon to India. My name is Rebecca Slieger and um, yeah, I work for Africa Green Tech in the public relation department. And yeah, I will start with the work from Africa Green Tech. So we are a German social enterprise that helps people in the global south to achieve more um, self-determination and growth through sustainable energy solutions. And we have a holistic system solution. So um, we realized impact sites in which entire villages communities in rural regions um, are equipped with electricity and modern technologies. And um, we have uh, rethought electricity and developed an in, in, yeah, intelligent system uh, that withstands with the harsh conditions of Africa's off-grid regions and for exceeds today's yeah, European standards. So as a social enterprise, our top priority um, in solving uh, social and ecologic, um, ecological uh, challenges. Um, however, this does not mean that we give away or donate our service, but rather that we interact with our customers um, at an eye level. 
So we call this work impact sites. So um, we call sites impact sites. So we create a basis for sustainable development with the help of local people and our energy solutions. And um, our goal is to promote not only the provision of electricity, but also the applications um, that build on it. So these include drinking water purification or enabling cold chains, um, internet connections, energy efficiency terminals or modern machinery for business and the promotion of education. So it is therefore important that an infrastructure exists or is built in the village to support people in uh, achieving these goals. So for us, um, this means running a school or maybe a hospital and small businesses. So with our mobile solar plant, we generate clean electricity um, where it is needed, namely in village communities that are far away from uh, central power grid. And um, we are building a state of the art mini grid to give people access to the energy uh, generated and providing sustainable and modern equipment to use the electricity um, efficiently. So um, these components make our system what it is a holistic and clean energy solution, um, a village or in our villages um, for our impact site. And we think um, electricity is the beginning of everything. So electricity is the SDG seven, so affordable and clean energy. So through multiply interactions, um, electricity has direct and indirect short and long-term effects. Um, so our impact model shows the effects that we have identified in the course of our field research and are continuously investigating. And in this way, the impact model also shows why we do what we do. So electricity is the beginning um, of a precarious side of sustainable development. And when, when people get electricity and can provide for themselves, the children can study at home in the evening because there is light. And many of our clients are self-employed and have restaurants or chicken farms or sell drinking street vendors. And this creates a cycle that has short-term and long-term effects on the lives of people who can live um, self um Yes, and I think this is, yeah, thanks to electricity. And also we develop an impact measurement system. So where you can measure how our work is clearly um, definable through the SDGs. So what does that mean? So for example, how many people have we provided with electricity for SDG seven or how many people um, now have more education for the SDG four or drinking water for maybe SDG seven or six. So um, this also makes it easier for us to prove and measure our true impact on the basis of the SDGs in order to present our work um, measurably, measurably in figures, for example, when we acquire investors. Because we at Africa Green Tech believe that uh, we want to create more impact and sustainable globally. It showed or it should also be measurable um, to show the progress from time to time. So we go to countries with respect and respect the culture and also explain our project to people maybe who cannot read or write in the villages with pictures that look like a comic. And it is like a two pager where we explain our work. And so we come back to the beginning of electricity is the beginning of everything. So if there electricity, children can start learning to read and write and early of this age. And also we have like um, scaling this business model in rapidly growing off-grid markets, which is projected to multiply more than tenfold in the next 10 years. It is a source from the uh, World Bank from 2019. And being an established company in markets like Africa Green Tech is well positioned to expand its leading to the role enable um, growing numbers of people to achieve, to achieve more self 
the determinations. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I'm really happy at what wonderful work we Africa Green Tech does. We're running short yes. of time, so I'm going to go straight into Ms. Shikha Shah, founder and CEO, Altman. You have the floor, ma'am, five minutes. Thank you, Ambassador Singh. Thank you, Sankal team, for having me. I am Shikha. I'm speaking from India today. And um, as somebody who loved science and technology, I spent a majority part of my teenage debating that whether what does the world need more? Does it need impact or profits? In the search, I worked with a number of companies, including NGOs, MNCs across continents in US, in Europe in India, and two unlikely projects in this search got connected. The first of which had to do with textiles. When we were studying this, we realized that we kind of use textile in a lot high quantity than you can imagine. It's only present, present right from your cars to carpets to clothes. The, the problem is that it's very environmentally hazardous. Most of your clothing right now is made of polyester, which is nothing but plastic. The second highest used material is cotton, which has a major issue of pesticides. It was clear that the world needed alternative materials. The other project that this got linked to had to do with agriculture waste. We found a source of this new material in agriculture waste. So the current technology that Altmat has kind of transforms agriculture waste, which is left after the farmer has harvested the food from the crop. We buy this biomass, get to our factories, and transform them into a sustainable natural material, which can then be used into multiple um, applications ranging from... Yeah, we can hear you, no problem. We can hear you, Shikha. I think it got stuck for a moment, but um, okay. till where could you follow? And you brought the biomass to your factory and you converted it yes. into so alternative material. We bring yeah. biomass, right. So this, this is the sort of biomass that comes to the factory, which can then be converted into anything that looks like this. Uh, we've been able to scale this technology from pilot to commercial scale factory, where we have now one of the highest manufacturing capacities of its kind, which can transform 1,000 tons of agriculture waste each year. Interestingly, in terms of impact, it is something that brings in uh, goodness from all the three angles of environment, where we can save a lot of water, land yield, carbon, and so on. In terms of society, it can create additional income for the farmers who might otherwise burn this waste only to create more pollution. And in terms of economics, it is not only a good fiber, but also a functionally high performing fiber with some of the characteristics like it being antibacterial and so on. In terms of German collaboration or European Union collaboration, we have tested a lot of uh, agriculture waste from Germany and from European Union. And it works seamlessly with our technology. And we see that as a first scope of interest in the collaboration, which is how can we replicate these production lines on different continents to more effectively use those waste? And the other is um, the consumption of these nicer materials in the European market. The policy in favor of sustainable textiles and the rising favor in the, in the consumerism demanding sustainable materials this could make up for a major chunk of new materials that Europe needs. So that's in another uh, you know, area where we see that the collaboration could be possible. And with that note, I would close my five minutes saying that I am looking to see how we can use this to our best. Thank you very much, Shikha. Again, a very well-structured presentation. And I really admire the way you talk about a sustainable partnership of waste management. Excellent. What a great idea. And the last of our panelists, but not the least, the co-founder of Village Data Analytics, Mr. Naveen Raj Gaire. You have the floor, sir, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Singh, the Sankal team, Trina, and Jinsep uh, Julian here. Um, hi, 
we we all live in a very hyper connected world we order food online in gemato swiggy and here in liferando we're constantly in our phone and can hardly find our way out of house without google maps but for a moment let's think about a world that is entirely unmapped and very well very unknown it's dark over there and we're talking about more than a billion people living in remote parts of africa and asia that world is changing. Bank and e-commerce organizers are planning to invest. Africa Green Tech here and the Tata Powers want to provide electricity and create impact. Geo and Atel will probably want to go over there and provide internet. Dalma wants to get coffee from there here to Germany. And governments and foundations are willing to invest in healthcare, education, energy, everything. All of us want to invest as much as 40 billion euro a year. But how? If you hardly know anything about these villages, where do they live? How big are these villages? Do they have infrastructure? Do they have marketplace? How do we invest? We can't simply invest in these remote villages without data. My name is Nabin Rasgare. I'm one of the co-founders at Village Data Analytics, and we built a data software to exactly solve this problem. It, Vita, or Village Data Analytics, automatically identifies remote villages across the world and puts their data on a map. We make them visible, comparable, and investment ready. We can tell how big a village is, how many houses are there, what kind of houses, is there a road, is there a security desk? What do people grow? Um, what do they have water? Is there a health clinic? What do they need anywhere in the world? Our users get Vida data, then they actually add in their own data. They go to the ground, they take their photos, their notes, design plans, their sensor data and everything. And the idea is that our data with their workflow can standardize this entire process of investing in these remote villages. We went live earlier this year in February. We are an organization that is supported by the European Space Agency. And now we are already operating in more than 15 countries on three continents, including in India. It's used by businesses, governments, and bank, um, the World Bank, the KFW Bank, different government bodies, large institutions are using this tool to actually now systematically plan investment in these remote rural villages. Uh, in fact, we started with energy access and first sites of ours are already up and running in Nigeria, Sierra Leone, uh, DRC. And now we're getting into other sectors like structured agriculture, healthcare, also telecommunication. We build Vida, the whole idea here is to create an impact at global scale. I was raised and born in like a remote village in uh, Nepal and actually was electrified by a mini grid like what Africa Green Tech builds. Um, I, in fact, actually myself built an electrification system in a remote village in India. My co-founder actually spent more than 10 years in India, again, in um, you know, sustainable uh, you know, solutions for remote part. And our entire team of data scientists and software engineers, all of us are value driven. We set a common goal that we will never meet the SDGs without investing more and more systematically in these rural parts of Asia and Africa. We're talking about one or more than one out of seven billion people, and we can't leave them uh, not supporting and can't actually achieve our STB goals. We're driven to make our software, the data, and a standardized rural investment planning uh, happen across the whole world and help bring these every villages, remote villages out of darkness by 2030 and meet the SDG goal. Thank you very much for giving me time Thank you. and opportunity. Thank you. I really like this idea of trying to, you know, get data from the villages. When I was ambassador in Germany and I had to go to German villages in search of middle stands to invest in India, I used to have the same feeling. Where do I get data about these villages? And they probably looked at me and said, what are these Indian doing here? So this exchange of data in villages, I think, is a uh, two-way process. I think we needed equally as much as the German needed to do it. Thank you. I think with that, we have heard several wonderful presentations. As a general thought, which crossed my mind, and I'm going to ask Julian as well, thought which crossed my mind, what is it that you need to go to the next level? Julian, what would you ask as one general question to our panelists? Yeah, so first of all, really, I really like every single one of the stories of the solutions that, we, that we're hearing. And now to get the, maybe also to get the, the, the discussion started, um, when we talk about internationalization, the, what are the main challenges um, that you've had and also so tapping into a new, new um, market? And um, 
also how did you overcome these challenges and what role maybe the collaboration in general with other partners, with regional partners at play uh, and um, um, what kind of support mechanisms are required for that. So really for this focusing of this Indo-German collaboration, but in general also the international collaboration in order to reach the new market. So Who would before like to I go to the panelists, are there any questions from the audience? Because we are short of time, I think we just need to manage this. Are there any questions? I don't see any in the chat box. If they come up, I'll go to them. But now I'm going to request to sit the same panelists in the same order. to Please respond to what Julian said and I said, but keep it very short. But we have less than 10 minutes. We begin with uh, Mr. Abhiji. What, is, what would you need and also what would Julian said? What are your ideas there? Our, um, current, uh, I think the success of our thing is to really scale up and economy of scale is what would really bring it to uh, uh, the cost we dream of selling to so many millions of people. So at this stage, we are looking at early investment to support uh, that cause to uh, sort of initiate and um, expand and create a good infrastructure to sort of plan logistics and the transport because our challenge is a it's a heavy and a voluminous uh, material and we do manage to do a flat pack of that uh, entire thing is flat pack it's self assembly DIY anyone could do uh, we still uh, at this stage looking at uh, uh, probably uh, uh, in investment. And in electric, uh, our electric tri-wheeler, uh, tricycle, uh, definitely a, a sort of collaboration in terms of uh, better systems from Germany or any uh, any any sort of uh, ecosystem from that could tap in. Uh, it will Thank really uh, boost our thing. Thank you very much. Bianca, briefly, please. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Investment is always an issue. Um, so I, I think uh, um, this is a, a topic which is valid for all of us. Apart from this, I would say, um, especially at the beginning, when you try to establish a footprint in India, there are a lot of bureaucratical hurdles. I mean, we know this in Germany too, but apart from this, I mean, consider the size of India, consider the diversity of India, consider the complexity of India uh, with all these different state and state languages, yeah? And especially, I think at the beginning, it's very, very um, yeah, challenging to orientate oneself and to find the right business partners and yeah, to set your entrepreneurial focus correctly. Yeah. So I think um, yeah, at the beginning. I fully agree with you. I think foreigners find India overwhelming. <laughs> and we often find European countries simple. Everything seems uniform. You know, everything looks the same. But there's so much, we are used to so much difference. Anyway, thank you. Uh, next, I think we have Mr. Dr. Ramesh Chandra. Yeah, thank you, good city. Uh, so actually, uh, means, uh, while we are trying to uh, set something uh, in terms of sustainability, uh, uh, we have we should not forget about our uh, uh, ancestors, what uh, they did before. Uh, because while we are uh, going forward, moving forward, and we are uh, pressing on technology, and we should not uh, forget uh, uh, the way uh, uh, means, uh, uh, we have reached here. Uh, the world was so beautiful all till date, and is still they're still beautiful, but. Uh, we uh, face this, uh, this pandemic uh, and uh, yeah, means uh, climate pollution and all these things are happening now. But I think uh, is uh, if we are uh, sometimes if uh, I, I, I look back to those days, to, uh, those back days, to the ancestors, how they were living uh, then with our technology. And uh, then also uh, from, from their way of living, we find some solutions. And if we can add certain techn small technologies, uh, simple technologies to that, then the world will be beautiful. Thank you. Appropriate technology. Very good idea. Mr. Aditya Pitti. Yeah, thanks, Ambassador Singh. So I'll echo most of the same sentiments. You know, capital is always important, but I have a different take. You know, all companies at all stages need capital. So it's something you need constantly. And I think there's enough capital out there. And if you're deserving, you'll get it when you need it. However, I think the most important thing that's needed is market support. You know, you need to start generating revenues and scale up. And in that, sometimes for companies who are initial stages, need support and handholding 
to crack customers who may be at you know kind of a doubt or skepticism barrier they like your idea they just not uh, you know pulling the plug i mean uh, pressing the button on it so sometimes if somebody comes in and supports as far as that goes or allows them or pushes them to do pilots etc you know we get a foot in the uh, door that sometimes more than enough and then merit takes over and we can start scaling interesting. thank you interesting the hand holding exercise helping to achieve market penetration yes rebecca Yes, so we also think investment is a great argument, and uh, yeah, I think also we need um, to hold more the governments more accountable. So we also say that instead of giving development aid, uh, governments should invest more in startups or in other investment opportunities, um, such as loans to companies like us or other startups that um, implement civil solution. And then I think you can also quickly give millions of people access to electricity. Yeah. Thank you. In fact, I have been campaigning with the Indian government to do something like Germany did with Africa Grow and do something similar and push that idea. Let's, I don't know if it'll work, but we are trying. Yes, uh, Shikha. Uh, when one works with agriculture waste, it's a very complex supply chain. So being able to identify the right players to work along with in collaboration becomes one of the key things. And same goes for when you work with a material on the market side, identifying the right brands and having them as your anchor brands in the initial time to offtake those materials into market plays, uh, plays an important role. So on both the ends, it's mostly about finding those right partners in the right location and being able to work more closely with them. So maybe in addition to what everybody said, this, this would be something that would really help us. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Gaire, you, what is your idea? So what is the thing that you really need to scale up because you do so much in trying to get data? To right. show there's no shortage of data. So what is it that you need? Right, um, very, very, very key point here. It's, it's, it's how do we involve the government and local institutions because they are key in uplifting so, such a large population and they play a major, major role. So how do we bring it into a dialogue that they need to invest based on data and bring this into all of their policy discussions, you know, programs and everywhere saying, here's the data and this is why we need to do this in this village and we need to do something else in another village. And also it's about creating that awareness that if we just don't systematically actually work in these villages, it will always be random. We can never achieve uh, change at scale. We need to take yeah. the 1 billion people seriously and uh, have to systematically work in, in these villages. And that awareness is something, uh, you know, the Indo-German uh, collaboration and GINSEP and all can definitely help uh, bring. Thank you. Thank you. So sometimes I find in India, it is difficult to get the government to focus on what we want. Right. Sometimes it's easier for us to focus on what the government is doing. So, for instance, in this case, there is a scheme called the aspirational district, mm -hmm. in which there are several districts in all over India in which government is focusing its attention. So, if you chose to work the data with, with, with those districts, I think you'll find a lot of support already happening. So, I think right. it's worth looking at that, and then we, when they change the list of districts you'll find another one. Uh, Julian, you have anything to add at this stage? Yeah. Almost at the end now. I, I would like to add here also what, what is in my experience, and I would like to ask that also to the to the other panelists, um, um, that to bring in this, let's say, competition between the governments, between the regional governments, that helps me a lot, because if I, let's say, do something with a particular German region or Indian region, then the other regions around that will be will be saying like, okay, I also want to get, do something. So kind of you create this kind of competition there as well, and that helped um, that helps me a lot in in in, in the GINSEP activities. Although being an, a government um, supported initiative, so I wanted to ask the panelists to what extent they they uh, agree with that, or if they think this is this is more difficult than it sounds. I think we are almost out of time, but let me respond to that rather than each other. I think it's a brilliant idea. So next time when we do this panel, let us call the representatives of two landers from Germany to join this. 
and see whether they will get involved with us. Already I know Karlsruhe, for instance, the city of Karlsruhe is interested in this, in GINSEP and work like that. And similarly, North Rhine, uh, Westphalia is interested, Baden-Württemberg is interested, Bavaria is interested. I'm sure we can get Thuringia interested. There are friends everywhere. So I think we should work that out and maybe every time we should bring two landers, focus with us and you know see what we can do with it. But I think we are out of time now. So before I'm reminded, I would like to thank all the brilliant seven panelists who spoke so well. And what impresses me more is that the creativity that you exhibit is amazing. And you really make the world a better place. More power to you, whatever between Sankalp and Jinsap we can do to help you grow, we will be happy to do so. Thank you so much for being part of this narrative today. A very good day to all of you.